Three four is there already? Three four, clear contact. Three four, clear contact. Thirty, nice and safe. Ten. It's last. Contact. Contact. And it's fine. This will be the final flight of our U.S. Air Force AC-10 Extended. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our ceremony will begin momentarily. Please take a moment to silence all electronic devices and prepare for the final farewell to our beloved KC-10. Air Force Base. I am Captain Brittany Sturgis of the 60th Aeromedical Evacuation Squadron. As a United States Air Force Airman and the wife to a KC-10 pilot, I am truly honored to be your narrator for today's events. Thank you for joining us today to bid farewell to the final KC-10 in the Air Force inventory. Tail number 79-1948. Excalibur, and to celebrate the legendary history of the mighty KC-10A Extender, the world's most capable aerial refueling tanker. Allow me a moment to set the historical context for today's celebration. In the aftermath of the Vietnam War and in response to Operation Nickel Grass in 1973, the United States identified a shortfall in aerial refueling capability. In response, the Air Force commenced the Advanced Tanker Cargo Aircraft Program, pitting the greatest aircraft of the day against one another to determine which would become America's next great tanker. The Douglas model DC-10 emerged as the undisputed champion. The KC-10 first flew in 1980, arriving from Long Beach, California, entered operational service in 1981, and the rest, as they say, is history. The KC-10 is capable of carrying a staggering 356,000 pounds of fuel to the point of need. Throughout her history, she has operated with consistent reliability, flying at unmatched high speeds, delivering her much needed fuel in both friendly and hostile skies. From her debut, the KC-10 Extender has provided the United States the capability to rapidly project American and allied air power anywhere in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it is in honor of her unwavering fighting spirit that we gather here today. And though today we are gathered at Travis Air Force Base to celebrate the final flight of the KC-10, we must recognize that these magnificent aircraft have served across the entire United States and well beyond. Originally, the aircraft served under the famed Strategic Air Command. They debuted proudly in their instantly recognizable blue and white paint scheme, adorned by the famous sack shield and banner. Later, they flew in the striking Shamu camouflage paint scheme, inspiring friends and intimidating enemies everywhere they went. They flew from Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana, March Air Force Base, California, and Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, North Carolina. They deployed far and wide, deep into the Pacific, bridging the Atlantic, and serving in combat and contingency missions around the world as early as 1983. In the early 1990s, she was reassigned to Air Mobility Command. Her paint was changed to its modern air superiority gray, and she moved to her final home bases, McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey, and Travis Air Force Base, California. 
Here, she would serve with both her active duty and reservist squadrons, operating meritoriously around the world when America needed her the most. Everywhere she went, she was loved by her crews and those who supported her. In October 1983, she launched for Operation Urgent Fury in Granada. In 1986, she fearlessly led a strike package of F-111s against Libya for El Dorado Canyon. She flew against Noriega in Just Cause in 1989 and launched in force to protect Saudi Arabia with Desert Shield in 1990. In 91, she valiantly served in Desert Storm, fueling all manner of joint and coalition partners as they liberated Kuwait and remained to enforce the life-saving no-fly zones that protected the airspace over post-war Iraq. She flew in 1995 over Bosnia in Operation Deliberate Force and again in 99 with Operation Allied Force. In the wake of 9-11, she launched on the initial waves of Operation Enduring Freedom, prosecuting America's case against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban regime with tremendous effectiveness and precision. She flew again against Libya in Odyssey Dawn and Unified Protector. She continued her service in Iraq with Iraqi Freedom, New Dawn, and the Global War on Terror. Her service continued to present day, where she meritoriously served through Operation Inherent Resolve and Operation Allies Refuge. And throughout all of these missions, she persistently linked the continents, escorting fighter aircraft across the vast oceans, maintaining a steady rotation of fresh forces around the world. In June 2023, Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst retired their final KC 10, tail number 84 0188, leaving Travis Air Force Base as the last remaining home of the legendary KC 10 extender. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we gather to close that legacy. Before we introduce our official party, we have a short message from the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Charles Q. Brown, Jr. Today marks the end of an era as we witness the final flight of the KC-10 extender. For over 44 years, the KC-10 has been defending freedom around the world. For its first combat role in Grenada, the KC-10 has been carrying troops into combat, transporting vital cargo and supplies, and performing aerial refueling for major military operations. There are few better sights I've seen from the cockpit than the silhouette of a KC-10 on the horizon with its boom extended and the relief I felt knowing I would soon get the fuel I needed to complete the mission. Thank you to the air crew, the maintainers, and the support personnel, and all who have been dedicated to the KC-10 success. Though the KC-10's journey ends today, its impact on our mobility and its place in history Thank you, General Brown, for that message and taking a moment to reflect on the mighty KC-10A. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of our official party and remain standing for the singing of the national anthem by U.S. Air Force Band of the Golden West Vocalists, Staff Sergeant Alicia Cancel, and the invocation by Chaplain Philip Smith. Stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. O'er the ramparts we watched were so gallant 
gently streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled If you would, please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we are here today to honor and remember the life and service of our beloved KC-10 extender. For over 40 years, the KC-10 has provided unparalleled refueling and cargo capability for our great nation and relief to countless countries around the world. Today, in this place and on this day, we say a massive thank you to the KC-10 for all the airmen who have ever flown in the extender. For the strength and safety it portrayed around the world, the very presence of this aircraft in the sky meant never before dreamt of missions could be flown. Our forces would have unheard of top cover because this platform did its job like none other. And while doing all of that, it brought our airmen home safely to their families and loved ones. Lord, thank you for providing this platform and allowing our country to use it to extend and project freedom around the world. For over 40 years, it has served well and faithfully. Thank you, big friend, for taking care of us. We pray these things in your most holy names. Amen. Thank you, Sergeant Cancel and Chaplain Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. At this time, it is my distinct honor to introduce the official party and the distinguished visitors for today's ceremony. We ask that you hold your applause until all names have been announced. The commander, 60th Air Mobility Wing, Colonel Jay Johnson, accompanied by his wife, Kristen. The Commander, 349th Air Mobility Wing, Colonel Patrick Brady Lee. The Commander, Air Mobility Command, General Johnny LaMontagne. Our keynote speaker, the 10th Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and former commander of the 9th Air Refueling Squadron. Retired Air Force General Paul Selva, accompanied by his wife, Ricky. We are also pleased to welcome several distinguished visitors, representing Assembly Member Lori D. Wilson, 11th Assembly District, Field Representative Wendy Fabian, the Command Chief, Air Mobility Command, Chief Master Sergeant Jamie Newman, Mobilization Assistant to the Commander, Pacific Air Forces, Major General Eric Novak, former Vice Commander, 18th Air Force, and former Commander, 32nd Air Refueling Squadron, Brigadier General Retired, Thomas Stickford. We would also like to give a warm welcome to all of our commanders, chiefs, senior enlisted leaders, first sergeants, distinguished visitors, honorary commanders, and to all those who, as we do, love the KC-10 Extender, welcome. Today marks the official end to KC-10 operations for the United States Air Force. As we bring the storied history of the KC-10 to a close, we recognize the accomplishments of the airmen that flew her, those who maintained her, and those who provided support in countless other ways. We also pause to recognize the last KC-10 still in active service out of the 60 originally delivered. Ladies and gentlemen, parked before you today, in all of her glory, representing the last of the extenders, KC-10A, tail number 79-1948.
1948 was the ninth extender built and was assembled at the Long Beach factory as Douglas serial number 48-208. She was first delivered to the United States Air Force at March Air Force Base near Riverside, California. She was presented in her magnificent blue and white paint scheme and proudly wore the image of a knight astride a charging dragon above the inscription Excalibur. Though her paint scheme has evolved, her steadfast reliability remains the stuff of legend. This aircraft has been involved in nearly every single United States conflict and operation since her debut. She's refueled Tomcats and Skyhawks, Eagles and Vipers. She's topped off everything from Phantoms and Raptors to Intruders and Prowlers. She has flown a total of 36,824.9 flight hours supporting worldwide missions in six out of the seven continents around the world. She has refueled over 125,000 U.S. and coalition receivers from across the globe. Excalibur and the members who flew, maintained, and supported her are testaments to our Air Force's passion for service. To Excalibur, we say job well done, fly safe today, and rest easy. Thank you for returning our airmen home to their loved ones every single time. And to those who breathe life into this machine each and every day, I congratulate you. You have completed a legendary chapter in American air power history with courage, bravery, and style. This nation owes you a debt of gratitude that can never be repaid. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we crank the engines on Excalibur for the final time, Please help me welcome to the stage the commander of the 60th Air Mobility Wing, Colonel Jay Johnson. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished civics, KC-10 friends and family. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's an honor to have mobility royalty with us here, and General and Mrs. Selva, thank you so much for taking the time to, to be here with us today and to welcome our new AMC commander, General LaMontagne. Sir, appreciate you taking the time to be here. Colonel Brady Lee, thanks for being a fantastic partner representing the 349th and the, the rainbow team that we have here at Travis Air Force Base to help us honor the KC-10. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to publicly recognize a, a couple of folks, Lieutenant Colonel Andy Baer, who's been behind uh, a lot of this over the last couple of days and months and months in planning. Uh, he's done a fantastic job. And Captain Phil Sangpet Surapan, who's uh, been behind this ceremony that you're sitting in right now. And then Chief Master Sergeant McCoy for the time, energy, and passion they have put in to making sure that we see Big Sexy off right and have a world-class event. So thank you to all of them. All right, so today we don't just say goodbye to a world-class aircraft, but we reflect on a legacy that lives behind, a legacy built by thousands of airmen who have flown, fixed, and supported the KC-10 Extender over four decades. For many of us, the KC-10 has been more than a job. It's been part of our family story, whether it's been fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, generations of airmen who have passed down knowledge, experience, and pride. We all own a piece of this incredible history, whether it was quizzing students on obscure diagrams from Larry Lamb or spending long hours on the flight line ensuring those reversible and non-reversible motor pumps were ready to go for that next mission. These stories define the KC-10 legacy. They connect us as a community, so be sure to tell them. The KC-10's legacy, it's not about the collection of impressive statistics, although you guys know that there are many of those, but more importantly, it's about the people. It's about the community, the airmen who made the aircraft what it is. It's about the camaraderie, the stories you've all shared with each other, the long nights, the deployed uh, deployments. It's about that shared sense of purpose, of working on and operating an aircraft that just, wasn't just a machine, it was a lifeline, a workhorse. It's a symbol of American air power. KC-10 seen it all from the early days of Desert Storm to the pivotal roles it played in Iraq and Afghanistan, all the way to the fight against ISIS. It's been that silent sentinel enabling close air support, extending a reach for our forces and ensuring the fight could continue wherever it was needed. Beyond the combat zones, the KC-10 was there for humanitarian missions, providing relief and aid around the world when it was needed most. And now, as we prepare for the KC-10's final flight, its legacy lives on in each one of us. We salute the American flag on the tail of 79-1948 for the last time. Our boom operator calls cabin ready. 
our flight engineer power set, our last pilot calls V1 rotate. As we do that, let's take a moment to reflect, reflect on the countless missions made possible by this aircraft. Reflect on the thousands of airmen who gave their all to make sure the KC-10 flew with excellence and with precision. We know this aircraft was a symbol of an American air power and it'll continue to be so. It's played such a vital role in operations, whether it's protecting lives, delivering aid, or projecting strength. As the KC-10 takes its last flight, its legacy doesn't end. With that last touchdown, those lessons passed on through friendships, through the knowledge you all have passed down through generations, continues to shape our airmen and our Air Force. So today we honor the 10 and its incredible team that made her journey extraordinary. Thank you for over four decades of excellence. The KC-10 and all the crews that flew it will be missed. So for the last time, handle down four green before landing checklist complete. A job well done. Thank you, KC-10 family. For decades, the KC-10 has taken to the skies to provide in-flight refueling, a vital capability that delivers global reach for America and is the linchpin to joint our projection. From its initial days in strategic air command through today, the KC-10 has linked the continents and guaranteed our promise of American air power anytime, anywhere. Even when Excalibur heads over the horizon today, the KC-10's accomplishments will never fade. But we can never forget it was not the metal that made the KC-10 great. It was the people. Generations of crews, maintainers, and support everyone gave their blood, sweat, and tears to build the aircraft's legacy that we honor today. Thank you to all of the Total Force Airmen who have served alongside the KC-10 honorably during peacetime and contingency operations around the world. Your legacy will endure. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the commander of the 349th Air Mobility Wing, Colonel Patrick Brady Lee. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, my. I am truly honored to stand before you today. On behalf of 349th Air Mobility Wing Airmen and Team Travis, welcome. Welcome, family and friends, to this momentous event. To our distinguished visitors, we are honored to host and share this historic moment with you. To the for Total Force team that engineered and executed this spectacular event, job well done. This is truly a ceremony befitting the last of the KC-10 extenders. As a former maintainer and occasional pilot, I am always mindful of every set of hands that touches the amazing aircraft we use to secure and defend our nation. The steady hands of citizen airmen and active duty alike who expertly maintained, supported, and flew on each aircraft with the sole purpose of keeping our nation free. The KC-10 has long and storied history with Air Force Reserve citizen airmen being a part of that story and that legacy from the very beginning. Even today, our final flight crew is comprised of Total Force Airmen continuing to highlight our collective sense of purpose and the seamless integration of Team Travis Airmen in the execution of our mission. Before the KC-10 takes flight for the last time and for its final mission, we'd like to share a short video clip from Major General Durham, the commander of 4th Air Force, Air Force Reserve Command. General Durham, sir, over to you. So I want to thank you for this opportunity to uh, addressing uh, the audience here uh, for this uh, ceremony, commemorating the, uh, the service of the KC-10 uh, for the last 43 years. Uh, it's been a great uh, platform and, uh, and it's been a great uh, airplane for the Air Force Reserve to operate since we got our first airplane and uh, the Reserve Associate Unit with the 78 at Barksdale. In, uh, in late 1981. We've been flying the airplane since then. I can tell you as an operator flying the C-17, uh, there's nothing quite uh, like pulling up behind a KC-10 in the middle of the night uh, and having those underbelly lights come on and, and your whole world just got better all at once. Uh, so thank you again to all the airmen, the operators, the maintainers, uh, the supply chain technicians, everyone that made the KC-10 extender 
of the aircraft and the airframe that it has been for the last 43 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the Commander, Air Mobility Command, General Johnny LaMontagne. Thank you very much and good morning Team Travis. It is great to be with you here today. I want to thank Colonel J.J. Johnson, Colonel Brady Lee for the 60th Air Mobility and 349th Air Mobility Wings respectively for hosting this event. It is absolutely the right thing to do to celebrate that airplane and to celebrate you. I'd also like to thank and recognize General and Mrs. Selva for making the trip here. It is greatly appreciated. JJ, you could not have picked a better keynote speaker for this event. More on that as we go. I'd also like to thank and recognize some Air Force and AMC civic leaders that are here today. Uh, Ms. Sandy Person, Dr. Sheila McCabe, thank you very much for what you do for our service as well as for our command. It's greatly appreciated. And to all the generals, commanders, leaders, uh, thank you for being here today. We are really here to celebrate you and your predecessors as well as that beautiful airplane. And I know what you're thinking. Who let that former KC-135 pilot on this stage? He has never flown a KC-10. Who put him on that stage? Who, who let him be here? It's Colonel J.J. Johnson. He's the one to blame. But make no mistake, I know how it works, right? We often talk about, from a capability standpoint, the tanker fleet in KC-135 equivalents. And we're looking forward to bringing the KC-46 online here. You can see that fleet out there today. But make no mistake, there's a huge difference between a KC-135 and a KC-10. I know it, and you know it. There are tankers, and then there are KC-10s. Right? There's probably two categories that matter. Capability, KC-135, KC-10. Right? I recognize my arm is not long enough. And then on sort of just appeal. It has been called Big Sexy, it has been called Gucci, and it is KC-135, KC-10. So it has a long storied history and you have celebrated it. You have lived it. You have made that history. And some of that history, uh, there's some parallels between the history of that beautiful airplane and General Selva's history in and around that airplane. That airplane first flight was in 1980. General Selva's first day in our Air Force was 1980. First flight in the inventory, 1981. First flight as a pilot with wings on his chest, 1981. There's some divergence and convergence there, and we'll come back to that uh, as we go. But it got off to a quick start. Operation Urgent Fury in Grenada, 1983. And then there was El Dorado Canyon. We needed a whole lot of KC-10s to take a formation of F-111s all the way around the European Peninsula because we couldn't get the diplomatic clearances. Only the KC-10, its crews, maintainers, and support personnel could have pulled that off. And if you want to hear some first-hand accounts of that, talk to General Selva. Also, Just Cause in Panama, 1989. And of course, going into Kuwait, Desert Shield, 1990, Desert Storm in 91, and then Operation Northern Watch, Southern Watch that came after that, right? That began a 33-year persistent combat deployment of that airplane and of this team. And when I say team, the team is bigger than Travis, right? Those airplanes were at March. They were at Barksdale. 
They're at Seymour Johnson in McGuire too. And a lot of you flew them at Al Dafra, at Prince Sultan, and many other deployed locations around the world. Indicative of what that airplane and this team can do, some of those first missions in Desert Shield involved four KC-10s taken off from the United States, flying all the way to Saudi Arabia direct with 24 F-15Cs bringing them to Saudi Arabia. Those 24 C models also had eight missiles apiece, four Sparrows, four Sidewinders, which meant a whole lot of drag and they needed a whole lot of gas. Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one airplane and one team that can make stuff like that happen. That was back on the 7th of August, 1990, the very early days of that persistent 33 year combat history sustained over time. For good measure, the team did it again the next day to bring another 24 F-15s out there. It'll be pretty cool to see two F-15Cs on 79 1948's wing later, later on this morning. And of course, the team kept delivering time and time again. After that, it was Allied Force with Kosovo, and then obviously the days of 9-11 in 2001, Operation Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom. This team and this airplane has been there and done that. And it continued after that. Operations Allied Refuge, bringing a lot of our Afghan friends home just a couple of years ago. And then the final flight coming back from that 33 year mission was basically a year ago this week. On the 5th of October, 2023, the KC-10s finally returned from the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, your chests should be really high You've got some really broad shoulders. You have made magic happen with your predecessors for the last 44 years. But I'm pretty confident you don't want to hear it from me. You want to hear it from somebody that has been there and done that in the KC-10. You want to hear it from somebody that was the 722nd OSS commander at March, who was the 9th Air Refueling Squadron commander right here at Travis the 60th Operations Group Commander right here at Travis. Went on to be a Wing Commander at McCord, Commander of the Tanker Airlift Control Center, Commander of Air Mobility Command, Commander of United States Transportation Command, and then the 10th Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, number two in our military of more than three million strong. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no one better qualified to give this keynote address then General Paul Selva, United States Air Force, retired. Good morning, and what a beautiful morning it is. I have to admit up front, I am a non-reversible motor pump. I only have one direction, that's forward. It's really hard for me to look back but I'm gonna to try to do that a little bit this morning. And, and first I wanna say thank you to all of you for being here, to our distinguished visitors, to our community leaders who have been beside Travis since my first day here, and to all of you who have given that machine life. And I'll return to that theme a couple of times. Big Sexy, Shamu, our beloved KC-10 is a machine. You can't hear me. Is this better? All right. I'm too close to a speaker somewhere and it makes it hard. So what, what I want to do is say thank you to all of you, to every one of you for everything you've given to that machine. Whether you are a maintainer, an operator, or a member of the support team that makes it possible for us to fly the airplane, you made the reputation that is the KC-10. I was here at Travis. 
in trouble. I was here at Travis when the first KC-10 arrived from March Air Force Base. The 9th Air Refueling Squadron that day numbered 30 people. Two crews and about 20 maintainers. And on that day we doubled in size and continued to double about every two weeks until we numbered over 600. A month after we formed the squadron, we had five airplanes. And in true Gucci style, we were asked to deploy all five airplanes with very little notice. That actually involved every one of our maintainers, every available flight crew, and a heavy duty set of bolt cutters. Because on that day, our Combs representative, who I love like a brother, was water skiing at Lake Berryessa. And we didn't have the time to ask permission to draw parts out of the supply bins. So we cut the lock, borrowed the parts, and the next morning handed him a multi-page list of the things we had taken. And in true style for the KC-10 team, he said, I have some work to do to correct my inventory. I hope everybody is safe. That is emblematic of all of you. I learned early on a short saying, we are KC-10 flight career, there ain't nothing we can't do. And that's really, we are the KC-10 community and there's nothing we can't do and you have proved it over and over and over again. We have worked miracles with that machine. Operators have taken risks and done things that people would not believe they would try. Maintainers have figured out ways to keep our reliability rate in the high 80s and low 90s for a 30 plus year old airplane. You are magnificent and you should be very proud. I look across so many familiar faces in this audience and it's really hard for me to come up with stories you haven't already heard. So I did an archeological dig in my house and I found my logbook. And I'm gonna give you three stories out of my logbook. One involves 1948. I know for a fact that the first day I flew that airplane was on the 2nd of December, 1992. My crew and I flew her on what we then called the Saudi Channel. We flew from March to Travis to Dover, to Ramstein to Riyadh to Dahran, spent the night in Ramstein and Dahran, turned around and reversed it. We left on the 2nd of December, we landed back at Travis on the 8th of December. Code one. Code one. Six days, 40 hours of flying, not a single write-up. I'll tell you, my happy place is actually in the left seat of Big Sexy, hanging off of the boom of another airplane. My most daunting mission in the airplane, and it pales by comparison to things all of you have done, was at Diego Garcia in 1994. We were, we were sent to Diego, it was actually 1984, we were sent to Diego to refuel an SR-71 that was gonna fly from Japan to Iran and back again, nonstop. Their job was to take pictures of what we believed were Iranian missile sites. We had deployed to Diego, we were sitting on strip alert, waiting to launch two KC-10s. My job was to take gas from the lead airplane and be available for the SR-71 for their fourth and fifth refueling of the night. For those of you who are not familiar with that airplane, it's black. 
On a moonless night, it's really stealthy, sort of invisible. The rendezvous goes something like this. Your air-to-air -air tack in comes on at 120 miles. You hack a clock. At that instant, you are nose to nose with an airplane that's going 3.2 times the speed of sound at something over 60,000 feet. You're going 0.825 Mach, somebody do the math, that's four times the speed of sound, nose to nose, and the only thing you have to execute the rendezvous is a stopwatch. And when the appointed time comes, you turn left and you hope you are in front of the SR-71, which is now decelerated to 310 miles an hour. And the only way you know if it worked is when he turns his TACAN back on, the numbers are getting smaller. Because if it didn't work, the numbers are getting bigger. And then it's an emergency because he's in front of you and he's going really fast and you cannot see him. And the technique to affect a rendezvous in that case is more magic and, and more hope than skill. So on that night, on their way
Air Crew aboard Excalibur. Lieutenant Colonel Bear, please assemble your crew. You are cleared for the engine start sequence. For those remaining in the audience, please remain in your seats. Sir, thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, while the crew makes preparations, we have a special video presentation. If you please direct your attention to the big screen for the final KC-10 tribute video. public affairs team for that wonderful video presentation. As the crew continues to make preparations, I will continue to narrate as the aircraft starts, taxis, and launches. You will see our air crew start Excalibur for the final time. 
taxi out onto the runway and launch the last mission of the KC-10 extender. Upon reaching a safe altitude, the air crew will maneuver the airplane for a final pass over Travis Air Force Base. Finally, as the aircraft makes her final pass, you may see a pair of fighter jets join Excalibur in a formation pass. These teammates from the California Air National Guard have volunteered to escort our final KC-10 on our mission to retirement. A sincere thanks to our partners in the Guard for their steadfast friendship. Thank you all for being a part of the final chapter of the KC-10 and recognizing its role in the defense of this nation for over 44 years. It is forever woven into the fabric of the history of Air Mobility Command, the United States Air Force, and the Department of Defense. A grateful nation offers the final thank you to the crews who flew her, the maintainers who kept her in the air, and the support personnel who pushed the KC-10 mission around the globe every single day. The flight today is commanded by the 9th Air Refueling Squadron Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Baer. Lieutenant Colonel Baer began his career in the KC-10 at McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey, and over nearly 20 years has accumulated 4,000 flight hours in the KC-10. Today, Lieutenant Colonel Baer retains overall command of the mission and is charged with the safe operation of Excalibur on her final flight to retirement. And in the seat right now, directing the engine startup procedures, is Lieutenant Colonel Gary Sane. Colonel Sane is also a longtime KC-10 pilot and the commander of AMC's Air Operations Squadron Detachment 1. Throughout the flight today, the U.S. Air Force's last KC-10 crew members from across both active duty and reserve will cycle through the seats operating their aircraft for the final time. Before Lieutenant Colonel Bear brings her into Davis Monthan Air Force Base for the final approach and landing, the KC 10 is powered by three enormous General Electric CF 6 engines. These massive motors power the KC 10 with 52,500 pounds of, of thrust each for a combined power output of over 150,000 pounds of thrust. With a light fuel load on board, like on today's mission, these motors will be powerful enough to send the KC-10 blasting into the sky with little effort. The normal startup sequence is to start the engine three, the, the number engine three first. This is the motor furthest from us in the hangar. When the checklists are complete and the ground personnel have completed their final safety checks, Lieutenant Colonel Sane will commence the engine start sequence. You'll hear a dull wind-up as air is introduced into the motor and a distinct light off as high pressure fuel is injected into the engine. When the motor lights, the wind-up will be replaced by a roar as the engine stabilizes at idle. Once the motor stabilizes, Lieutenant Colonel Sane will start the number one motor, the one closest to us. Finally, when both wing engines are stable, the crew will light off the number two engine up in the tail. Let's pause as the crew lights these giant General Electric CF6 motors.
Today's KC-10 is flying under the call sign Gucci-10. This will be the aircraft's radio call sign throughout its entire mission. And speaking of mission, let's talk about the route of flight. After, after, I don't know, yeah, we'll wait, I think maybe the engines are, test, test, takeoff, the KC-10 will maneuver for a final pass over Travis Air Force Base.
today. Today's KC-10 is flying under the call sign Gucci-10. This will be the aircraft's radio call sign throughout its entire mission. And speaking of mission, let's talk about the route of flight. After takeoff, the KC-10 will maneuver for a final pass over Travis Air Force Base. We'll talk about that final pass in a moment. Once the aircraft has completed her final pass, Gucci-10 will climb to a safe altitude and maneuver over San Francisco and out to the Pacific Ocean. Gucci-10 will then turn southbound and make a run down the coast, soaring over Half Moon Bay, Santa Cruz, Monterey, and the Big Sur coastline. As the aircraft approaches the greater Los Angeles region, she'll maneuver to make a turn inland, passing directly overhead the Long Beach Airport, her original home and place of assembly. Gucci-10 will then track eastbound across Joshua Tree National Park towards Phoenix, Arizona, before making a turn southeast for Tucson. Upon reaching the Tucson metro area, Lieutenant Colonel Bear will check in with the local controllers and align the aircraft for her final approach into davis monthan Air Force Base, the final resting place for Excalibur, where she will join 55 of her sisters in long-term storage.
Miss John, I think, um, so what I think we should do from here, um, I think pick up here, and then when I give you the thumbs up, say UT10, the final Tracy 10, who just received her final takeoff clearance, um, and then, um, and then, and actually, Maybe, maybe, maybe read up through. Okay, um, start right there. Before takeoff check is Oh, okay. Before takeoff checklist completed. At that point, ladies and gentlemen, Gucci 10 will push up her motors for the final time, setting history into motion and commencing her takeoff run. Let's pause to watch. In a moment, the KC-10 will come back around and will be joined by two fighters. Please stand by.
right now. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. This is the moment we've been waiting for. From the left, approaching at high speed and low altitude, is Gucci 10. Please join me in celebrating your last KC-10 extender, tail number 79-1948, Excalibur. This final KC-10 flyover represents the wonderful community of operators and maintainers who have kept this magnificent aircraft in service for America for over 40 years. Whether reservist or active duty, whether aircrew, maintainer, or supporter, the personnel of the KC-10 are second to none. So let's all look one more time as the mighty KC-10 extender, a veteran defender of freedom, makes her final pass over Travis Air Force Base. Ladies and gentlemen, from the left, your KC-10A extender. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being a part of the story of the KC-10 and recognizing its role in the defense of this nation for over 44 years. 
This jet and her associated personnel are forever woven into the fabric of history. Thank you to the crews who flew her, the maintainers who fixed her, and the support personnel who kept the mission moving. This concludes our ceremony. Thank you for your support, and thank you for visiting us here at Travis Air Force Base. Please drive safely.